to the Italian Football Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Italian Football Podcast. My name is Nima Tavallo, filling in as the host for Carlo Garganese. We have a very special co-host, but before I get to that, just go through what we'll go through to this um, this episode where we'll be reviewing Juventus' win over Napoli. Napoli really uh, in struggling now for top four. We'll be talking about Atalanta's crazy three five goal uh, thriller in the th- win against Milan. Roma and Fiorentina act out maybe what some would say a couple of scenes from the Gladiator. Um, Inter smash Udinese. We'll be talking all of the rest of the Serie A um, as well as previewing the. Uh, fi- the final group stages of the Champions League this week, Badge or Prem Face and Serie A's of the week. Um, for all our first time listeners, um, this is our Monday free, uh, free weekly episode that we do every Monday, reviewing the weekend Serie A action and all the biggest talking points in Italian football. If you want to support the Italian football podcast and receive all of our content that we do throughout the week, including a weekly QA episode every Tuesday where we answer all the questions sent in from our patrons, plus the weekly Thursday midweek review show, plus interviews, post match reaction, and much, much more, then go to patreon.com slash TIFP and become a subscriber for just $2.99 a month plus VAT. Uh, now you can also sign up to be a paid subscriber on Spotify. We'll provide the link in the description. Same price and same terms apply. And for all of you who listen on Spotify, Apple, and iTunes podcast, we really appreciate if you give us a five-star rating, give us a follow and a like. We're on YouTube as well. It really helps us grow and do more quality content for you guys. So let's get into today's show. As I said, we are joined by a very special co-host. Uh, he's been on the pod many times before. He's a very good friend of ours. Welcome, Adriano Del Monte. How are you doing? Grazie, Nima. Doing very well. Great to be with you. Right. So let's start with the first game. Um, Juventus-Napoli. That's the, that was the biggest game of the weekend. Mm. And Juve, let's start from the Juventus point of view. I mean, this is another impressive win against the big side. Mm. They, 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 you know, they, they've managed to, I mean, this was something that Juve were very highly, were highly criticized um, for last season that, you know, or Allegri, I should say, or has been highly criticized um, that for, since his re- return, you know, the, the, the results mm. against the big sides, uh, of course, in the Champions League, but also in the Serie A. But this season, they've beaten Napoli home, mm. beaten Milan away, beaten Fiorentina away, beaten Lazio at home. In all mm. of those games, they've just conceded one goal. Um, they've drew Inter at home. They drew Atalanta, Atalanta away in a goalless draw. They've played all the big teams except Roma, and they've conceded two goals, and they've only drawn two, won the rest. Mm. That, that's incredibly impressive. Absolutely. Look, I know that Carlo has certainly been uh, vocal against <laughs> the current coach for, for some time, but look, certainly I think... I think where the credit is due for Massimiliano Allegri and this current Juventus squad is that they're certainly making the most of what they can. Every opportunity, they they seem committed, they seem united, and it's a it's a level of determination that we've seen present among some of the the very great Juventus sides of old. Now we know clearly on paper this isn't the best. Juventus squad, the best Juventus 11 we've ever seen. But there is something special brewing there. And and look, you know, we'll, we'll get on to Inter later on, but the fact that it looks like a two-way race for the Scudetto as we approach the halfway mark of the campaign, it's a, it's been a, a tremendous turnaround for a team who, of course, have struggled very frequently, both obviously last season in Europe and, and domestically in recent seasons. So, it has come. It has come along very nicely so far. There are no signs whatsoever that, that they're going to slow up anytime soon. And obviously, as was discussed by many coming into the start of the season, no European football for Juventus could be the blessing in disguise that helps get this team and this club back on track. So, look, no mean feat, of course. Napoli are nowhere near what we saw last season. Obviously, the change of coach hasn't helped. Well, two changes of coach now in in the space of six months. But this was um, a statement victory. There, there's no. No doubt about that because we remember it was this meeting in Naples last season that all but ended or that gave the belief for Napoli I guess that the Scudetto was alive and this time around now a really really important win and one of many you've already touched on on the results this season but for a Napoli team who did the double against Juve this season really really important win both on the pitch but also for the mentality off the pitch as well so this Juventus side not going anywhere anytime soon. 
They're really not. And I mean, the winning mentality point is something I wanted, wanted to talk about because mm. this is, this is uh, to me and you, we've seen you versus the great you through the years. I mean, this ruthless efficiency, um, mm. They, I mean, on, on, on the, if you look at the stats, the XG was 08.0185 versus 0, 0.086 in the first half, and 0.1.09 versus 1.23 in, in, you know, Napoli had 1.23. Look, Juve score, Napoli probably had better chances, but they didn't. And it's yeah. not just the defense, it's the, for me, I want to talk about the, that to me is, is a sign of a Juve who seem almost, you know, inevitable in the sense that they've got that winning mentality and that they are, they just, they just can't be stopped. It looks like that. And we saw the clips, or if you're watching or covering the match, you would have seen it live, but then there's been plenty of uh, clips doing the rounds on social media post-match with the attention the defenders in particular were giving mm-hmm. to Aussie Man and co in attack. It, for, for me, having covered Juventus so many times this season, again, it's very different. In Serie A this season, they seem they're focused on the on the one competition, and I think that has enabled Allegri to. I mentioned earlier, but unite the squad, bring them together. They they have looked well last season particularly. They they looked a mess at times, lacking a game plan, lacking an identity, and lacking a purpose. That's changed. One one thing I take away from this match was I loved, and it's not certainly not the first time, but Dusan Vlaovic is an example of a player maybe who hasn't been at his best under Massimiliano Allegri. But I loved the scenes when Gatti scored, obviously what was the match-winning goal. Watch Vlaovic's reaction. Watch how thrilled he is for Gatti to again score. There is something special within the team. And we've seen this historically at club level, at national team level, where sometimes it isn't the star 11 that will win you a trophy, but it is that unity within a squad that will bring the best out of everyone in that squad. And I think across every line, we've seen improved performances. And you, again, as I said now at the top, you would have seen the, the scenes, particularly post-match, of particularly the attention on Aussie men and, and the challenges being put in by Bremer and Danilo on Ossiman and they were like goals for them. They were they were they were pumped up. They were celebrating and they were really really committed for 90 minutes. There were no lapses in concentration. It's a team that are really clear on what they're doing, and it may not be the prettiest football. Allegri loves going one nil up, and and that's that. But they are getting the results, and that's at the end of the day, that's all that matters, and that's why they're we're two points off the top of the table as we approach the halfway mark. Yeah, and and, and speaking of uh, picking up on that on the Juventus defense, I mean Chesney. That save on Di Lorenzo was crazy, um, but unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> and and I mean, you know, it's another clean sheet for him. He's it was his eighth. Juve have nine mm. in the Serie A. Uh, Perin uh, obviously had 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 the nine or the first one uh, of the season. But Federico Gatti is becoming mm. this Bianconero cult hero. These, I mean, from the thing that I find the most impressive thing is this all comes on the back of that horrific performance against Sassuolo where he mm. scores one of the most, well, the most embarrassing own goal I think I've seen in Serie A ever. Mm. Um, and it, it was an absolute disaster. And it, it feels to me like what you're talking about, Allegri there, this becomes a little bit like he almost embodies all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. I couldn't, of- ag- I couldn't agree any more, Nima. There, he's, he's an individual who obviously his story has been well documented where he was only a few years ago to where he's come now. It is remarkable that in itself. Is it also partly due to how Juventus have fallen in recent seasons that the opportunity has come about for him perhaps, but he's taken that opportunity and and grown. Now, Mm -hmm. certainly uh, responding to what happened in, I think it was late September in that 4-2 defeat away to Sassuolo, to have turned that around and have performed as consistently not only the goals, but perform as consistently as he as he's done for both club and country. Remember, he played for for Italy. He played ninety minutes in the match against North Macedonia in Rome, which was oh, they did concede a couple of goals, but still very important for the country. So he's had this responsibility thrown on his shoulders, and he's delivered very well. And I've been super impressed with his performances. Uh, well, basically since then, I remember he scored in the Derby della Mole against Torino a few weeks after that, and obviously in the last couple of Serie A fixtures, Monza and Napoli, he's been the match winner. So it is a, a beautiful story, really, really special story, and he's certainly been a key part as to why Juventus have been in such incredible form. 
Mm, yes, it really has, and it's 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 like uh, like I said. I mean, for me, it's like he almost embodies everything that Allegri's done that is going well for sure. with you. But, um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about Cambiasso. I mean, we talk about him quite a bit on the pod, but I, I have to say, I think this has got to be one of the most intelligent signings you ever have done ever. I mean, mm. he's t- if he continues to you know develop this way, the fact that he can play on the right, can play on the left, and he does so, he, he can invert him, he can play him wide. These Zambrotta similarities aren't going away, are they? And they're not. They're a player who can play everywhere, and I think that's what's exciting most Juventus fans. The similarity is certainly there for me. It's been really refreshing to see uh, – well, is he young? I guess 23, Serie A, certainly under Allegri is young. So it's good to see a young Italian who's capable of playing in multiple positions come through and have the impact he's had. So I've been really pleased to see that. Again, really reinforcing the, the Italian part. It is good to see uh, – potential longer term future international start to make his mark at a top club that has been really nice to see but the, the role he's played for Juventus the importance and also what's been more important is because he's had the consistency of appearances and, and the minutes we are starting to see consistent performances which you know for a player obviously who's jumped around a few clubs in in recent seasons yeah. it's it's never easy to move to a top club like this and you know again not even halfway through the season really consolidating himself as one of the well the, the, the key new players at any club in the top flight in Italy this season so keeping keeping it you know obviously still in the earlier stages of of his career here at Juventus but really impressed with his start so far no, he really has. He really, really has. And I wanted to just basically, you mentioned Dusan Vlaovic. Um, mm. He was unlucky at the post. Mm. What do you make of, I mean, this This has become, this is like, will he stay? Will you ever get rid of him? I mean, mm. where are you? Do you think we're seeing the start of something here? I think I chop and change my mind on uh, Vlaovic or Aznima, to be honest. I certainly believe in and see the potential. But, it, look, I, I guess that there was a lot more talk, particularly with a Bayern Munich before Kane went yeah. to Bayern last summer. But yeah. I always was under the impression that, look, if, uh, like Delict, if that 70, 75 million offer comes and Juventus don't stand to lose any or too much money on the player, I think it was maybe there was a, an opportunity to sell and, and reinvest elsewhere. But, Again, I mentioned the, the the unity in the squad. You you can tell it's very very visible. The 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 unity in that attacking trio or whoever it is, whether it's Vlaovic, Chiesa, or whoever else is up there. The attackers are going through the ranks there in this team. They're, well, not attacking trio, but whichever attackers sort of rotate through through that top two, irrespective of how they play, what they play. This is a team through Vlaovic, through Chiesa, through Milik, and all the attackers that go through that. I, I think they're building something together. Moise Keane. I don't know if disrupting that at this time with this Juventus squad is the right thing to do. So Vlaovic, still young, has proven he has been a, a capable player, certainly at Fiorentina, of course, in the latter stages of his time there where he's scoring scoring lots of goals. I still think that potential and ability is there. Uh, is Allegri the right manager for mm. Vlaovic? Well, that same That's question can question. be asked for, almost in, for anyone in that squad. And so... Yeah. Obviously, there's plenty of talk that perhaps Allegri may move on at the end of the season. Well, maybe it's worth keeping Vlaovic under a new manager because then perhaps the sky's the limit. So I, I think at this stage, I think my mindset as of this day, Nima, let, let's let's see Vlaovic stay in yeah. Serie A at least for a little while longer for this Juventus team. But look, I think that debate uh, can be had and I think you can argue either side pretty strongly, but I'll stick with uh, keeping him with this current Juve side for now. Yeah, and, and speaking of Juve, just to finish off before we move to Napoli, um, you know, they're just two points off Inter, and which mm. is inc- impressive. And we're going to get to Inter. People are saying this is, you know, the, the greatest in- attacking football Inter have ever played in their history and blah, 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 mm. blah, blah. But Juve are only two points behind. Uh, mm. Can I mean, what do you see? Do you only, do you think Juve can win? Do you think this is sustainable, this this model? Do you think Juve can, can actually do this? Look, you, you've touched on the, the results and the results are the fact that they've beaten everyone they've needed to beat. It's plain and simple and they've done it without conceding goals. And so as strong as any team in the league, defensively, you know, Juventus have proven that that's how, that's how titles are won. They've done that before and at the moment, having played almost every team in the competition, they're on track to doing that again, at least challenging. My thoughts in the league this season is that Inter are – 
by far the strongest, not only domestically, but right up there in Europe as well. So I think Inter are, are certainly the favourites, but it is great to see a strong battle between these two heavyweights, which I think certainly will go the distance. I'm very confident, given the fact that Juventus don't have European football, I think that Inter have the ability to compete on all fronts for every single trophy on offer this season. But I think that when we get into particularly February, March and April and into perhaps getting into the latter stages of the UEFA Champions League, I think this will be a moment for Juventus to, to certainly maintain the pace there. And, and I think this will go right down to the wire with Inter remaining the favourites. But I've been, look, from a very, very neutral perspective, which is how I work. I cover this competition in depth and obviously cover Italian football across the board in Europe and at international level. I'm just very, very pleased to see the top clubs in this country doing very well once again, and obviously a couple of them going through some difficult moments, but it is just great to see that ongoing competition and really a bit of unpredictability as to who will win the league each and every season. Yeah, that is, it is by far the most exciting league in the world, isn't it? Or in Europe, I'm sure. It's, it's just, it's not even mm. the fact that you have so many different, you know, potential winners and you can't really say with, with any certainty. And also mm. the madness of Italian football we're going to get to as well just keeps it going. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about Napoli because they are in deep trouble um, mm. and they actually can miss top four, which to me was just unthinkable. I can't even believe I'm saying that. Likewise. But, uh, it's, it's just this. How this? It's, it's virtually the exact same squad minus Kim and Jay, mm. and it's just not working. Um, you know, they create, but they don't seem to to be able to score. I mean, they created high quality chances against Juve, but they couldn't get a single finish on target. Mm. And I'm I'm thinking Matsari steadied the ship defensively, but they aren't scoring. That's right. I, I th- uh, look. I don't know. Getting into the mind of a Napoli fan right now. Luciano Spalletti's made the, the the perfect decision. Obviously, I don't think if if he left, I don't think they would be in this position. I think they'd be uh, no. certainly right up there, still challenging once again. It must be very frustrating, but I think uh, this is a Napoli team now that you're right. Uh, unfortunately, and quite incredibly, they not, not risk, but they seriously risk missing the top four. And obviously, if they are to miss out on top four for next season, if they are to miss out on a return to the UEFA Champions League, well that would almost certainly mean that the two main men up top will move on. I think that there's under no circumstance could I see Ossiman and Karatskelia remaining with Napoli next season, which would obviously set them back much further because even if they were to get 100 plus for, for each player individually, who can you go and appeal to without Champions League football at that stage? Mm-hmm. I think it will be a very, very difficult sell with, with respect, of course, to the fact that they still obviously remain the, the reigning champions of Italy. I haven't lost hope though. And I, I don't, because you said it, it's the same squad. It is the same squad who, yep, they're, they're certainly now a little stronger defensively than we saw earlier in the season, but they're just lacking that, just that, that cutting edge up in attack and, and obviously that what we saw last season. And that's come with a couple of shaky results early on and they just seem to have lost that confidence. So already more defeats at the Maradona this season than for the entirety of last season. You know, a, a defeat on the road to, to Juventus, a, a venue that they had success at last season. It just seems to be a very different look team from than what we saw only a few months ago. But still impressed by some of their performances. Obviously, they've taken two defeats, but they took it right up to Real Madrid. Doesn't matter what form Real Madrid are in. That's always a big team to, to take on. They did take it right up to them, both at the Bernabeu and at the Maradona. And look, they, they were very likely to go through the Champions League. They'll draw a very nice opponent in the round of 16, I'm sure. So look, there's still stuff, I guess, to look forward to. But this is an upbeat team that over this upcoming period, it's not going to get any easier unless they start picking up some really important results. And they've got over this pretty difficult period now. And well, they got over it by just playing the matches because there wasn't much gained from from the, this difficult period. But a lot of winnable matches ahead and they really now need to capitalize and get themselves back up the standings. I was looking at their fixtures now before coming, um, before we, we got the recording underway and the likes of Mons and Torino and Salernitana across the Christmas New Year period, really we need to see this Napoli team now surging up the standings because uh, yeah, otherwise that top four next season will become a, a long shot, which is quite incredible to be saying. It really is. And I mean, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm looking at, um, their their big game 
you know, record. And that was something that was really good. And especially domestically last season, and you know, the, the top seven, uh, the, the, the top seven internal league table. So mm. far, I mean, if you're looking at Europe, they've lost twice to Real Madrid. Fair enough. Mm-mm-mm. Then lost to Inter, lost to Juve, lost to Lazio, lost to Fiorentina, draw Milan. Okay, they beat Atalanta. They, be, they won every single one of these games last season. That's right. It's, it's, They're losing it, the matches that count this time around. Yeah, they really are. They're not even yep. taking points. They're just no. one or two. Um, you know, they, they drew Milan and beat, beat, beat Atalanta, but every other mm. one, they just they just get nothing from it. Um, and I'm starting to ask myself, I remember last season, everyone was discussing if, if Milan's title defense was the worst one of the last mm. two decades. I'm wondering if Napoli's is worse than Milan. <laughs> Well, that's that's. I think I think you could be onto a strong point there. It's it's to be honest, not something I had thought about until this exact moment. So this is my fresh reaction to this point. But no, look, I think I think it is. I think it's a valid point, especially because of the fact that we are looking at a, effectively the, the same the same squad here minus Kim. Yeah. It has been just so disappointing. It it really has. We know that, irrespective of what happens this year, we know that Napoli, the club, we know that the city, they know. We know they'll be talking about that Scudetto for years and years to come. It was, it, it, it's just such an incredible place. I, I love going every time I, I'm fortunate to cover a match there, but it is a, a beautiful, beautiful place that, look, obviously they haven't celebrated the same amount of, of Scudetti as the, as the two Milan clubs and Juventus, and they have been very much, uh, you know, living in the moments of, of, the, of their history. It is always such a beautiful place to visit, and you always feel the passion, the love the fans have for for the club, the city, of course. And and look, obviously, they have uh, been a club that haven't had the same success in terms of Scudetti as the two Milan clubs and Juventus. And look, they they have been a club that have celebrated Scudetti of the past, and certainly, irrespective of what happens this season. Last season, Scudetto under Spalletti will be one that they will continue to celebrate for many years to come. It will always be a special memory, but there will still be disappointment because I, I do think, again, particularly from from the matches in Champions League and and obviously Serie last season that I did cover, it was evident that the, the fans there did feel that they were building something special. Yeah. And that won't take anything away from the Scudetto, but... It is. It feels like oh, it, it's already over. And going back to the initial part of it being maybe a, a, one of the more disappointing title defenses, uh, I'm I'm in shock. I'm in shock where they are currently at. Okay, maybe they weren't as strong, going to be as strong as an Inter this season. Obviously, looking very strong on paper and getting much better Champions League finalists. But I think there was still that belief and hope from the fans that they would at least seriously challenge. And again, the fact that we're so early in the campaign and well, their hopes of retaining that Scudetto are completely over. It's uh, yeah, it must be a tough pill to swallow this early on. But again, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I do. I do still have some, some optimism. I still do. And I'd like to see them turn it around, but they're going to have to do so very quickly because uh, the, the gap to the top four, okay, very small today, but that can change very quickly tomorrow if they don't start picking up some points very soon. Mm, for sure, absolutely. Um, someone, uh, another team that could potentially be drawn into a battle for top four is is Milan. Um, mm. Things are not looking good there at all. Um, they, I mean, this was an incredible game against the Atalanta-Milan game, and, and I want to start... Well, let's start from the Milan perspective. I thought the positive was to see Mike Mignon making the miracle saves that he usually does, mm-hmm. especially with the, the, the I think it was Lukman. Uh, he mm-hmm. that, that, is one of, that is one of the saves of the year. I've, I've never seen the, the, when he does these miracles. It's just he, he's unbelievable. Some of the saves he does are just I, I gasp for breath. It's just genuinely crazy, and I don't think you can really blame him for any of the goals. Mm. Um, I think Benassa coming back is incredibly important for them. Um, Theo is in a back four, actually has worked out really well as a central defender. Mm-hmm. Um, Luka Jovic scoring again. And, and I mean, of course, they, you know, they showed resilience and character to get back twice. And, and you could even say that they could, I felt that after Jovic equalized, uh, they could have gone on for the win, go, gone on and gone for the win. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I think this was a step forward in performance wise. W- would you agree with that? I do. I do. I do agree with that. Obviously, they come up against a, 
okay, an opponent not in the best form themselves uh, in Atalanta, but there were there were positives to take away. Obviously, it's been a, a tough period for this club with a number of injuries and a number of issues, and obviously the Champions League schedule has been very tricky. No, no easy games in that competition ever, but certainly not in, in Milan's case. But look, it was a look, it was a good spectacle for Serie. A. Let's say that as a starting point, it was a very very good match, an incredible finish to the match. But it's a Milan team, Nima, with many, many areas to to analyse, to to assess, and perhaps change uh, as they go forward. But look, I think they will take positives out of the game. I, I can't wait to to see what happens in the Champions League this week, uh, where as Milan go to Newcastle, because the Newcastle team who have issues of their own. But look, uh, for for Milan, the, I, as I said, I think there there are each line of of the park on the pitch off the pitch there are questions to be asked and this is a club at this stage at this point of the season that could be analyzed uh, for the entirety of the program but as things stand they remain third they remain third fairly comfortably for now and obviously given Napoli's struggles this season I think that does give them the edge when we talk about who will be in the running pretty seriously for the top four this season so look it hasn't been a perfect season by any stretch for 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 Milan but given what they've gone through given the issues they've had the injuries they've had I'm not saying they'll take it being you know nine points adrift of Inter at this point but I think they're doing as well as they can at this stage of the season they are but I have to talk about the talk about the negatives in this game to me Calabria Mm. what's going on here um, What's going qualitatively, on? qualitatively, he's a squad player at Milan. Okay, he was mm. a, fan, he had a fantastic season when they won the Scudetto, no doubt. But to me, he's a squad player at Milan, let alone being a captain. And the mm. lack of leadership qualities to be a captain and the ridiculous discipline, two bookings in 13 minutes, the second in the 93rd minute, in the middle of the pitch, when you can actually, your team can actually go on and win, win the game. For mm. me, that's that's unforgivable. It's a Milan team that really lack leadership at this point, and I think that's been uh, glaringly obvious on many, many occasions this season. I, again, covering so many Milan fixtures, it, it's a it's a very different Milan team than when there was the presence of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, for example, whether he was playing or not. And of course, this week there have been the reports all but confirmed that Zlatan will make a return to Milan finally and be part of the board again. So that's expected to be confirmed very soon. And it is all about just getting those figures back at this proud club. And and for Calabria, look, I think the reality is he he's not an Italian national team player he's he's he perhaps is in a in a stronger Milan team you're right he's probably a squad player but given the time he spent at the club and given the fact that he's he's a, he's someone who understands the club I guess that's why he does have have yeah. the armband at this point but it was disappointing the couple of yellow cards there in in that short time towards the end of the match and he will be suspended now it, it's that's not leadership material so it was a, a disappointing end to the match of course Muriel scored what 90 seconds after that yeah. second booking which just you know just brought made that moment even worse so again many areas to to analyze and and discuss and certainly defensively certainly in terms of its leadership this is a team that need a shake up uh, on that front and I, I do think that given the major turnover for Milan of obviously Tonali sold big money Milan went out and purchased a number of players Look, I, I was I was optimistic from a Milan point of view, but I was never confident that you know adding so many new players to to a team would suddenly turn things to turn things around and, and and just suddenly bring them back to the top of the game. I think it's going to take some time, and I certainly think that patience is required. But the leaders that are currently there, and Calabria being one, he he's been there for so many years. He does that they need to be. Again, leading from the front, proving. Look, look at Agatti at Juventus. hasn't been there for that many years, but mm. I think he's playing with that passion. That what it takes to be a Juventus player. You see, so many Juventus players of old talk about that love they feel for that club. I think Milan lack that identity at the moment, and obviously, only a handful of players. I'm just looking at the eleven from the weekend. How many of those players have been there for for multiple years? Well, not many at all. So it's a it's a club in transition. But I think, as I said, I think it is a club that are. At their best, I guess, although they haven't been too impressive, I think this is their level at this point in time. Maybe, yeah, that, that, that could be very well it. Um, and to me, I think to build on that point that you said, um, 
I think there's 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 a lack of belief mm. in the sense that you yeah. know in this game they didn't create that much, but they had efficiency, but the belief wasn't there. Whilst games in the mm. Champions League, in Dortmund and Newcastle, especially, they created loads. Yeah. Just couldn't seem to score because it didn't feel like they believed in it enough. Nima, and- that's spot on. I can't, I can't. Re- I'd love your take on it because, again, covering there has been such a difference this season. Being there, pitch side, covering Milan in the Champions League compared to covering Milan in a in a lesser Serie A match. An example, I was I, the matches were very very close when there was the the PSG home match day four Champions League, and it was actually three days apart. It was Udinese on a on a Saturday night. San Siro, Udinese went to San Siro one one nil. It was a lackluster performance from the eleven on the pitch, the substitutes that came on, even the feeling in the crowd. It was there was something different. Three days later, it was PSG. It was something special. There was a feeling of magic in the air. I remember saying it on the broadcast that I was working for that night, and I just said I I, I didn't come here optimistic that Milan would get the result tonight, but as I entered the stadium and I felt what was going on inside, it felt like they were going to do it. And well, obviously they came from behind. They they won two one. It has felt like there has been a bit of a bit of that spark lacking. And where does that start? Mm. Where does that come from? Again, I do, I do think that does come from from leaders, but I also think that that's where the management need to come into question because that's an important yeah. role in in motivating a squad. So is that purely? Uh, I'm I'm not sure, but certainly there is something lacking on that motivational front that we have seen in in recent more successful seasons. Mm, I agree, I agree. We just got to pay tribute though to Atalanta and start with mm. we can't, we can't start anywhere else other than Luis Muriel take about <laughs> what a magical goal that is. I Amazing mean, <laughs> when he is at his best. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that Muriel produces moments of pure world class. The mm. question has always been with him is that he's in, he's too inconsistent a player to be branded world class, but his ceiling is unbelievable. That's one of the most beautiful goals I've, I've seen. Beautiful, beautiful finish, and uh, obviously against Manyan, who had been wonderful once again. Mm. Uh, amazing. Look, and, and in a short cameo to come off the bench and, yeah. and do that, having not not had too many touches on the ball, it's uh, there, there's you could you could use every adjective in the book. It was absolutely perfect, and yeah. Well, what to wait? It was his first set our goal for the season as well? Yeah. If yeah, yeah, so special, another special moment, and those moments of brilliance again. I, he's right up there with the very best in Serie who have done it over the years. His highlight reel, very special indeed. Yeah, and, and just Adam Ola Lokman continu- continues to impress. He, he, he should have had a hat trick. He had a shocking miss, but you know he did have a brace. And, and I'm thinking he looks. He's looking like he could be the next big money sale for Atalanta. That's um, the way he, they do things. They do. And I want the one thing about Scalvini. I wanted to ask your opinion about that because I think yeah. with him, me and Carlo have been discussing. We're not quite sure what 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 to think of him, but mm. I think he's he's actually very good going forward. He's yeah. relentless. I mean, that that position when he wins two tackles and pushes for that that's him. And I'm starting mm-hmm. to question, because, and also because of his, how poor he is defensively, mm. is centre back even his position? Yeah, I'm. Um, um, yeah, I, I think I'm on, certainly on the side of perhaps a little freer up the park. It is more Scalvini's. Go. Uh, he does look more comfortable when he, or he looks certainly uh, many times. He does look uncomfortable defensively, one on one situations. And I think he's a player who. Well, we saw we saw some moments at, at the weekend uh, against Milan, getting so high up the pitch. And look, he is still so very young. This is this is a, again uh, putting my my Italy hat on here. This is a very good to see a player who is uh, capable in in various roles. And yeah, I think perhaps we could see. Yeah. Maybe at Atalanta, the player shift to a position a little higher up the park, which would be thrilling to see. Of course, he has had some very difficult moments defensively, especially for the national team. He played, it was the Italy-England match, I think, where perhaps was yeah, it? Yeah, oh was my it God. Going? Yeah, I was there. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of, of someone who had a shocking miss and a shocking, well, 10 years since moving to mm. Italy, Charles de Kettler. Um, that has got to be the miss of the season. I mean, that's genuinely embarrassing. Uh, I, I wish for his sake it didn't happen in this match, but I think, I think, uh, I think his, unfortunately, you're spot on. <laughs> his reaction, too, was just said it all. He's just head buried in his hat. I mean, he just, he's, I feel bad for the kid now. I mean, this is getting ridiculous. 
No, I do. He did get his assist, though, Nima. So yes. he, he came away sure. happy in the end, at least. Look, I have to say with the Catalan, he. Uh, Good friend of mine, and he's been on the sh- on the show here before. Paul Ocon, of course, former Australia yeah. captain. He was the assistant coach of the Catalan yeah. Club Bruges. Now, he told me very much. He was very excited when the Catalan made the move from from Club Bruges to Milan. Said that he's as as good on the ball, as exciting a young player as he had seen come through that Club Bruges, uh, the academy, the ranks there. So, look, I've always had um, an extra soft spot for for De Ketelaer, but moments like that, I guess, don't help his cause. But oh, look, I'm still, I'm, I'm still hopeful that, that he can turn around because he's he's had a very, very tough start to to life uh, in Italy. Certainly, in his time at Milan, yeah, he's had a decent goal of it so far at Atalanta but yeah I, I just uh, I do wish for his sake he would have put that away because he, he needed he needed that and that would have been a good moment for him personally but in any case yeah he's going to win the award for, for the biggest miss of the season I think after that I, it's, it's just unbelievable and he's, he's already got one as well I mean it was a couple of weeks back against <laughs> Hill last year, that header from point blank range it was like oh my days um, <laughs> it's um, I, I really feel bad for him and I'm starting mm. to think you know, time is running out here. And are we potentially talking mm. about him being the worst signing in the Serie A of the last two decades if you take into mm. consideration how much he cost as well? Well, perhaps with performances like that, he unfortunately may be the case. Uh, look, <laughs> how much time How much time can the player get? To, look, he's um, he's got the talent about him, but if he's not delivering on the big stage, well, yeah, the, the money that was invested in the player, there is that pressure that comes with it. So the, the pressure is certainly on. Again, another miss and performance like that at the weekend perhaps doesn't help uh, his, his cause there to, to consolidate his future in the country. But he's, again, still in the earlier stages of, uh, of another move to another club. Give him some time and hopefully for his sake he can turn it around. But, yeah, it's going to have to happen very quickly because no, uh, that, that pressure isn't going to stop. No, it's not, and and it's it's a shame because because I, I do think we do. There is a player there. I just don't. I just don't understand because mm. I mean, Atalanta is really the right. You think you know when you look at it objectively, you think okay, Milan was a step too high up from Club Brugge, yeah. from Club Bruges to yeah. go to the reigning champions. Fine, but Atalanta is the right piazza, no? And then you mm-hmm. see him do stuff like that, and and you know you can one thing though he did get the assist, he did make mm-hmm. some for good forward runs. Hopefully he can turn around because I do think there's a player that I really do. I hope so for his sake. I really do. I, I look, he's a. It was tough. It was tough for him in Milan. I hope he can turn it around. But that's that's football at the highest level. There, that pressure's there. He's got mm. some some opportunities against against some weaker opponents with respect in in coming weeks and obviously another Europa League match to come. So plenty of opportunities ahead, but the pressure well and truly on. Mm. And, and for Atalanta, then Gasperini you know, finally wins a big game. I mean, they lost to Inter, they lost to Napoli, mm. they lost to Fiorentina, they lost to Lazio, they drew they drew Juve, and now they, they win win a big game, and they're absolutely in the top four race. And they're in it with Roma, who, I don't know what to call what happened at the <laughs> Olympico. I mean, if, if, if Inter are known Pazza Inter, then I don't know what to call Roma. They're psycho. Roma are psycho. <laughs> the only thing well, can... Roma, Roma have Mourinho. Mourinho remembers what it's like to be at Inter. So it... <laughs> no, but Roma, Roma, Nima, Roma is the team that I, it's very, very hard to, to, to assess, to analyze. Roma can be a lot of fun. It can be a lot of crazy. It can be a lot of everything. And uh, look for, for this Roma team, uh, the, the, well, where to start? Obviously, nine men they finish off. The Lukaku red, there's crazy scenes as always. Great atmosphere at the Olympico. A 1 1 against Fiorentina. A Dibala injury, uh, which is n- not good news there on that front, but still unbeaten in Serie A. What, they had the, the defeat to, to Inter late mm. October. That was their only defeat for, for the last two months. So, yeah, it's a Roma team that somehow, some way, are well and truly in the in the race for for the top four. And Mourinho has had his moments this season. He's had his red cards and been sent <laughs> off. But it's it's a team that are picking up enough points to to keep themselves in the race. I, I want to pick up on that because I I'm look I love Jose Mourinho one hundred percent. I mean he's an interist as an interista any interista would love Mourinho and the magic that he pulled mm-hmm. winning the treble there. But this awful dis- discipline stuff. That at Roma, mm. okay, Zalewski's stupid second yellow, Lukaku with a horror tackle. I'm, I'm thinking he'll probably get mm. three matches suspension for that. And 
And then you, and I'm starting to think, and I'm looking at Mourinho and his antics and the stuff that he says and does and and his backroom mm. staff being sent off all the time. Look, I know Mourinho's always wanted to create an us against them mentality and his teams have mm. always been teams that play hard. You know, they're, they're hard teams to play against. They, they But now they're playing ugly. I think mm. Roma are an ugly side under Mourinho. And I, and I mean in sense of the way that they foul. It's just so cynical. I've never seen Mourinho yeah. teams do this. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? I mean, this is surely all of this is Mourinho's fault, no? I, I agree. And I, it's that word ugly, which I have to also unfortunately agree with, because it's it's not pretty on the eye. It's not, uh, well, some of those challenges at the weekend, uh, you know, un, uncalled for, un, unnecessary. And it's it's disappointing. Of course, even even last season, I was there in Budapest, the, the final, the Sevilla Roma final, and the, just some of the, the the comments in the lead up in the post match it, it it sets the tone it's it's what it's what Mourinho's Roma are all about and they were hard done by in that match for me there was a, obviously a couple of moments that perhaps could have gone their way as opposed to against them but you, you're right I don't know really you well you don't know what to expect from Mourinho's Roma except that it is going to be ugly that's the that's the consistent yeah. theme and that, that, that yes they are getting some results there have been some dramatic wins it was what the the Lecce match a couple of weeks ago where they scored two goals in stoppage time and then came from behind and win so they, they are pulling off some really dramatic r- results and but overall the football the division it I you know, I start to think when I look at a Mourinho team like this how much longer will Jose be there for yeah. and is it is it perhaps the the beginning of the end of this mm. phase of his career at, at this yeah, club. Yeah. And that's sort of where, where my mind drifts to, as I see that sort of football, we know Mourinho's had great success everywhere he's been. And if he decides to retire tomorrow, if he decides to move on tomorrow, he will always be regarded as the legend of the game. And yeah, just, I just, I think uh, I just get the feeling that perhaps this is the, the, the latter stages of his time in the capital. I, I couldn't agree more. And I'm one starting to think that this is the latter stages of his career at mm. club football too. Um, mm. I'm starting to think that maybe international football is where it's at for him with Portugal or whoever. And mm. uh, yeah, because this is this is genuinely unwatchable. And 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 I don't mean uh, you know I'm not talking about how you know beautiful play. I'm talking about the the ugliness of it, the the cynicism Correct. of it, and 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 the and 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 not. And the fact that he just doesn't seem to, you know, in the past, Mourinho had at least had self, you know, he could reflect upon himself. And now it's just he's turned into this like it's it's gone toxic in a way, everything where it's always someone else's fault. It's Berardi's fault. It's the referee's fault. It's <laughs> it, it, there's no self-awareness there at all. And I'm no. looking at it and I'm going, why are you doing this? Why are you turning the entire environment into this toxic hellhole? When you're mm. actually in locked in in the race for the top four, you have a decent yep. squad that can take you far in Europe. You know who knows you could actually win it this time. You know with mm-hmm. a little bit of a good draw, and you, this is a missed agree. opportunity for you. You could have put some distance between yourself and Fiorentina, a direct mm-hmm. rival. You could have put some distance between yourself and Napoli and Bologna and Atalanta, mm-hmm. who are you know especially Napoli, who will wake up and will have an easier fixture list now. And mm-hmm. instead, this nonsense. This complete and utter nonsense. I, I genuinely, uh, I don't understand it. Like I genuinely don't get what he's thinking. No, I don't. And you, everything you've just touched on there, that's not benefiting anyone. And no that's one. where I don't see where the logic comes into it. And it's uh, it, all I can put it down to. I can't get in the mind of Jose Mourinho, but all I put it down to is it's lacking a bit of care because he's just doing it without real thought. And then that's where I start to, to raise the question, well, is he starting to check himself out a little bit? Because it really, really makes no sense for, for anyone involved. It's not benefiting their relationship with, with the league, with the referees, with the clubs, with anyone. It's not helping them. You, you, you're calling out the media, you're calling out journalists, you're responding to them in different languages. You're not, you're, you're not maintaining good relations with anyone. So what's, what's the plan? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But Mourinho will, will say, well, I've been there and done it and won it all, so let me do my way. That's yeah. the best way. And, and we just watch on. But look, I enjoy the entertainment, but it's certainly not doing Roma any favours for me. It's really not. And I think it's such a shame because it's a missed opportunity. I think Roma actually have a shot at finishing in the top four, either winning the Europa League and getting back to the Champions League. And and this nonsense, the, the lack of discipline, that's the thing. Mourinho's teams have never lacked discipline. Now I feel there's no discipline. It's they. It feels like 
I get the sense when I watch Roma that Gianluca Mancini has become has 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 calmed down, but everyone else has caught the Mancini <laughs> bug. <laughs> <Like, laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, good way to put it. And, and it's it's crazy. It's like it's a team of Gianluca Mancini's back in the day when he was unhinged, <laughs> and, and he's the least unhinged on this Roma team. And I'm thinking, this is not normal. <laughs> no. No, it's it's not, and and even look again. Just bringing up the the Lukaku challenge again. Oh. How many red cards has Lukaku had at at club level? I wouldn't think too many in his no. career, and it was just a bizarre challenge for 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 him to do that at that stage of the match. Again, making no sense. So, not that that direction is coming directly from the coach, but there is that tone and that mm. attitude and that approach to to play in a manner of, I guess, uh, a, a very physical manner. And the player has responded and he's done that, which made absolutely no sense. So, mm. yeah, certainly questions need to be asked there. And But Roma, if they are to, to play that style, with that style of discipline, well, that will hinder their chances of a top four finish next season. Mm, it certainly will. And and just to touch on Fiorentina quickly, um, I mean, they were invited right back into the game after the Zalewski injury. And I think they will be kicking themselves not to have won it, given that Roma ended with 10 men. And and this is something mm. we've been discussed on the pod quite a bit, where Carlo and I disagree a little bit. I'm keen to hear what you think. Mm. Yes, Fiorentina create chances, but the attack lacks bite. Is it an mm. Italiano problem for not being able to develop the players he's got? Is it just bad luck? Is it a qualitative issue? Is it all of the above? What, what's your what's your thoughts? Oh, Fiorentina have been have been a good watch. It's been a, it was my first love in football, Nima Fiorentina. Really? So I've always got a soft mm. yeah, I've always got a soft spot well, for, for Florence Fiorentina. is a beautiful city. So there's no it, it is it that. is a, it is a beautiful beautiful city. But look, it's a Fiorentina team who who have had their who have certainly had their moments. But yeah, I I, I think the look quality and attack against some of the, the the top clubs that maybe have just come undone a little. I was at the the Milan match just before. Um, just before the the end of the month there, and yeah, it was look that they had they had their half chances, but it wasn't a look they they had the the bulk of the play they had the more of the attacks, but just not threatening enough in that final third. And obviously, I've really enjoyed Bonaventura's turnaround and his performances this season, but I think they certainly could do with another attacker of of a high level of quality if they wish to compete both domestically and in Europe. So look, I think it is a, a bit of a combination of all, but Italiano. I've loved his progression. Uh, it has been it's been good to watch, and I'm sure he goes on to to a bigger club. And I'm I'm sure with with some with more of that quality in the final third, maybe his ideas come to to fruition a, a little stronger. But it's uh, look, I think it's a little bit of everything. So I'm a bit on the fence with this one with with the the viola here. But I think where they're at, where they're playing, how they're performing at, at all levels, it's been a really refreshing story to see. Uh, well, not a fallen giant, but obviously one of Italy's fame, mm. famous clubs, like right back up there doing doing nice things. So mm. always keeping a close eye on, on on Italiano and Fiorentina. But yeah, I think if they really want to compete, just that added quality in in, the, in attack would make all the difference. But look, in any case, it's been a, a positive start again to the season. Mm. It is. And I mean, the reason, I mean, if, if Luka Jovic continues to score and he continues mm. to do it at Milan, but he was just unwatchable at Fiorentina. I think there has mm. to be some questions need to be asked of Italiano that, OK, you play attacking football, but it doesn't seem like, you know, it can't always be the attackers. And it's been it, quite no. a few attackers that have failed under him. Has, has been the case. I, I think Jovic, look, Jovic is a, what an interesting career Jovic yeah. has had. Obviously, he scored in those last couple of games, but I but just from just from my perspective, I think he's a difficult player to be able to to judge Italiano mm. on. It's he's still finding his feet. Obviously, at Milan, it's been good to see him get amongst the goals recently. But he, obviously, he's not been anywhere near the level he was before he made that move to Real Madrid consistently. No, so it, no. it's a player who look to to just judge Italiano on he. No. Okay, perhaps, but uh, I think I think he still needs a bit more. I think a few more examples to see yeah. where Italiano's at. But look, I think uh, players of higher quality across the board. He's got he's got good ideas. Let's just see. Let's just see how he would go at that high level. I think it'd be a, an interesting prospect, and of course, perhaps a, a candidate for a potential big club job that may become available in the well, maybe mid season, but probably at the, at the end of this season, if a few clubs decide to make a few big calls. Yeah, I mean, I think Napoli, uh, Italiano and Napoli feels like either De Zerbi mm. or or, um, or Italiano at Napoli feels like mm. the most logical move. Um, moving uh, to Inter, who we've mentioned a couple of times already, 
against Udinese, another dominant performance, 74% ball possession, an XG of three and a half, eight shots on target, 17 in total. They hit the woodwork. They could have scored nine. <laughs> I mean, mm. it's just, and, and it looked so effortless. That's what I'm, you know, that, that's what I look at this. The, the, the way that Inter felt like they were going on in second gear or first gear. They, 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 they didn't, it didn't feel like Inter were take, pushing too high. Um, I mean, Lautaro, 14 goals now in 15 Serie A matches. He's on, score, on course to score well over 30 plus in the Serie A. And I wanted to pick your brains on this because I don't know where I stand on it. But mm. there's a, this discussion in Italian media. If the football that Inter play is the best attacking football Inter have ever played. I thought Gianfelice Facchetti, the son of uh, Giacinto Facchetti, say something to that mm. effect. What, what do you make of that? Look, I, I think it's a, it's a fair... Fairly strong point. This is an Inter team that are as good as any team we've seen in Serie A for me in recent seasons. I think as good as any team in Italy since the 15 Juventus team that went to the final in Berlin against uh, against Barcelona in the Champions League. And it's a team that are, are absolutely, for me, they're complete. Stronger than last season. I was there at the Champions League final and obviously on another night they win that match. They beat Manchester City no problem because it was an incredible performance. And that's the level that this Inter Milan team are at. That's why for me they're the clear favourites to, to win the Scudetto this season. They're the clear... For me, they're, they're a clear top, top team to go very deep in the Champions League again, irrespective of what some of our friends in England might say with <laughs> Arsenal being <laughs> perhaps being stronger than them for no reason whatsoever. But this is a this is an Inter Milan team who have absolutely impressed me. I love covering their matches at Sun City or watching uh, with, you know, with a sellout crowd and the support and the love. And this is a club that are doing wonderful things in the city of Milan. And I think it's a, it's a team on every single line that, that are strong, they're together. They're, the, the signings have been absolutely remarkable. Jan Sommer, I, I knew he's a, he's a top goalkeeper and I knew that would be an absolute steal. I had no doubt about that. Same as Pavard, of course, injured at the moment, but these are real deal players at the absolute top of their game. And, Obviously, sorry for the Onana situation, but given what Sommer has done and what Onana has done, that's made that move look even even better. So it's been uh, remarkable in, in goal. Lautaro, for me, is uh, one of the very best players in world football at the moment on form. Turam is one of the best signings of the season across any competition. That midfield is as good as any midfield. And obviously, defensively, they've started to build... Well, they've built on what was a, a strong, mm. a strong partnership defensively. Uh, the trio last last season it's got even better with with some depth as well. So, nothing to fault about this Inter team. Inzaghi has done uh, remarkable things, and really need to need to believe and dream big because this is a team for me that really can win it all this season. Mm. And I know you said that, and here's the f- uh, that you said that on social media as well, that look, don't mm. sleep on Inter to win the Champions mm. League. And, and I know other people have said so as well. I mean, they went to the final last season and they look better uh-huh. this season. My only thing with, with that is, or, or this notion of this is the best attacking football Inter have ever played in, in their history and mm. so on. I actually think, I'm not quite there yet, I actually think that there were moments in the first in Inzaghi's first season, where Inter played mm. fantastic football, absolutely mm-hmm. stunning football, uh, even better than now, but they didn't end up winning that. Um, and and yeah. but I do think that there is a different. This is but on the other hand, then I'd say, well, this is a different Inter. It's a much more mature Inter. It's not an Inter that mm. bum rush games. They they control them. They 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 are much more mature. I mean, there was a stat of. Some, something like eight or nine games have been won in the second half by Inter this season mm-hmm. in the Serie A alone. And, and the fact that they, they, they act like that, and that's what you need to do as a big team. But the Champions League point is really intriguing for me because I see you say it, I see other, other people say it as well. And I'm thinking, what is it about this Inter side that has you thinking that they can compete mm. with the likes of, of, well, above all, Bayern Munich for me? Mm. I'm with you as well. I think Bayern, Bayern are on top. I, it's a good question. Now, what is it? It's it's obviously off the back of last season because, again, I really strongly believe that that final was there to be won yeah. and Manchester City win and they're the, they're the best team in, in Europe and that, that's that. So history states that, but it's a Manchester City team at the moment that remain the favourites for – for the Champions League to defend their crown. But I don't think this is a Manchester City team that are looking as good as they were last season. So 
certainly not writing them off. If Inter were to draw Man City, I think that Man City would go in as favourites in that tie. But that's the case. They're the team on top. Bayern Munich, I agree with you. They're, they're my team on top. Obviously, the addition of Kane just well, that complements what, what they were lacking, and that's still a very, very strong team top to bottom. Real Madrid are probably the next one there, and it's it's Inter for me next. So, look, I think I think what gives me the confidence that Inter can, can match these clubs is the fact that I think Inter is the best unit. I think Inter is the best squad. I mm. think that Man City have had a couple of changes, and I, as I said, I just don't think this is the same – Man City is last season. Bayern, obviously, with Kane, but they have had a couple of really underwhelming performances this season. They were beaten at the weekend by Eintracht Frankfurt 5-1. They've, they've had a couple of matches. I covered their match against Manchester United in match day one of the Champions League. They won it 4-3, but conceded three goals to Manchester United. They, they, they let their guard down defensively very easily on a few occasions. So, look, it is perhaps picking a few particular moments, but I don't get the sense that these teams are unbeatable. Real Madrid as well. We know how good they are. We know how good they are in the Champions League, but obviously this is a Real Madrid team who, well, they're, they're not at their absolute best. They do have the signing of the season in Bellingham who is doing ridiculous things, but this is a team that are not as deep as we've seen under Ancelotti in previous years, not as deep as the Real Madrid squads we've seen previously. And we know that that depth, particularly in the latter stages of the European season, really come mm. into play. And, this is an inter team that, well, it was against Benfica, effectively played a, a second team and mm. in order to rest for the Napoli match. And obviously the 3-3 against Benfica, not ideal, but the result was enough. Come out against Napoli, seven goals now in the last two fixtures. Going into the Real Sociedad match this week, I think this will be a statement performance by Inzaghi's Inter. And I've engaged very lightly, Nima, in a couple of debates ahead of this match. And... <laughs> Putting myself on the line saying that Inter will comfortably beat Real Sociedad because mm. they are really one of the favourites in my eyes. So, look, I just think that Inzaghi has played it perfectly this season to date. And I think they have the depth and quality in the new signings that have come in mm. that are as good as any other of the top clubs in European football. So, just very confident from what I've seen the first few months that they have what it takes to go very deep again this season. Mm. Yeah, well, from your mouth to God's ears, eh? <laughs> well, um, this just briefly rest of the Serie A. Salernitana lose to Bologna. Bologna having an incredible season. But I have to say, Salernitana goalkeeper Costil making two, I, I don't even know what to call that, to mm. gifting two goals, as Eric said, who does continue to impress. Um, and, you know, Bologna continue to impress. You know, they're, they're mm. punching well above their weight. They created quite a few chances to score. I mean, Ferguson hit the, hit the woodwork. How far do you think they can go? I mean, they are equal with Roma. Surely they can't get a top four spot, no? Sure, surely not. But look, stranger things have happened. Yeah. And it is a Bologna team playing some really, really nice football. And again, look, these stories are always wonderful. A Bologna team under a manager who has, well, had a strong start, but obviously he's, he's moved around and now he's found a, a place where he's been able to really unlock the potential of this club. And it's, it is great to see, but I'll tell you my, my, uh, I guess my analysis post Salernitana one Bologna two, my reaction is this. I look at the, I look at the league. I look at where things are at. And I, I've had the debate with myself for a long time where Serie A should go to enhance and strengthen the competition going forward. Do we need to go back to 18-team competition at mm. some point like the Bundesliga have? When I see performances like this, some of the errors made, I I think I am in favor of perhaps going back to an 18-team league at some point. I think that the, just to ensure that that quality at the bottom, we, we've seen some, with respect, we've seen some really poor teams be relegated from Serie A over the last decade or so. It's something that I always think about when I see moments like that. On the other side from Bologna, the story, magnificent. I love fairy tales. But if this Bologna team were to make the Champions League next season, mm. if they were to finish in the top four, that's not going to end well for anyone because the club would lose its top players, no doubt about that. Bologna, as a club, to be able to remain competitive in three competitions is going to be near impossible. That's not going to benefit Italy's coefficient ranking that's not going to benefit Serie A's future prospects in Europe I look at things like this neutrally yeah. I cover Italian football you know how I work and that's not going to be something that's going to bring more eyeballs 
to our competition. And I'm all for these stories. I love them. I hope Bologna do exceptionally well. It's nothing against Bologna specifically, but it is a moment for our league where in order to maintain the pace with the top competitions, we need money, we need investment, as we have discussed for many, many times, Mm. and we need our clubs performing very well in all competitions. And a result with these two sides who – are at different ends of the standings, but it just gave me a moment to just reflect on where the league is at. And we obviously have a few issues that we need to analyze, discuss and improve in. And I just think that there are a couple of areas where across the board, if our mid table clubs like a Bologna, like a, I guess a Fiorentino is in there, Torino, these clubs, if they had more money behind them, if they had more, yeah. more opportunities to develop like the clubs in England that have more wealth across the board, we would be in a better position to facilitate these clubs playing European football and facilitate these dream fairy tale runs. But at this stage, if that club were to go into Europe, mm. that's not benefiting anyone next season. So I don't want to be sour or negative on, on the moment, but that's just my my take from, from that match between those two sides in contrasting form. And one person who would definitely leave Bologna, or I think he will regardless, I mean, if they finish, you know, I mm-hmm. think they'll finish in the top seven. I think European spot feels feels really, well, you know, feels almost a, a foregone conclusion, although nothing's done, it's far from it. But Thiago Motta, he's, is he ready for a big club now? Well, I, oh, I think with with a couple of the roles that will all but certainly become available, and given this performance with this Bologna team, I think that uh, the moment will be there and the moment mm. will present itself and, and it's a moment which obviously we'll have to take. So I think so. It's been... Uh, it's been an exciting journey for him so far, and, and if he can... Again, look, I think it's always the case. We discussed with Italiano before, but for an opportunity for a manager to go into a a bigger club with a bigger budget, with higher profile players, with more, with more quality in, in and more depth in the squad. It's really exciting to see if that individual can take the next step and, 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 uh, you know, across multiple competitions in Europe as well. So I, I think if the opportunity presents itself, it will be a beneficial one for all involved and really excited to see what the future holds because he's, he's got his ideas, he's got his, he's got his philosophies and he's sticking to it. And I'd really love to see him take on the very best at the top of the game. Mm, absolutely. And I think Milan, especially Milan or Napoli are the ones mm. that may be looking at him. And I think Salernitana, unfortunately are going down. Um, it's breaking so my too. heart. Yeah, and it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm. And and I mean, Pirola having the chance to equalize towards the end there just sums up their season. Um, Hellas mm. Lazio, I I don't Lazio. I, I I've given up on Lazio. I, I don't know what to. I, I just I watch them and they just confound me. I, I don't know. They're an enigma. <laughs> they, 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 how do you how do Same you finish second in the Champions League? And you can actually win your Champions League group. We're going to get to that in a moment. <laughs> and then you can't even you can't beat Hellas away. And and it's just like I I don't understand. It's just it's such a head scratcher with Lazio. And now there's even you know the the, the fans are fed up with Sarri now. Uh, mm. More and more yeah. fans are screaming Sarri out and i'm but i'm thinking well is it really sarri out is it more lotito out is it that they didn't sell immobile I, I'm, I'm confused adrian what do you think no i'm so i'm scratching i'm i'm doing as much scratching if not more than you are nemo because it's a uh, no it, the the results are all over the place it's a club that it's a club that are, are struggling i'd say more so off the pitch in terms of where they're at, what they're doing. Obviously, they lost Milinkovic Savic, and it's a it's a club with some very look, still some a lot of quality in this squad. Yeah. And they have their moments where they are where they're very impressive and play some incredible football. Of course, they've had some of the the moments of the season, the Champions League. They've had some really special moments, but just so inconsistent. Obviously, not so much harmony amongst the fan base towards the manager. The manager, I saw the comments recently Sadi made about his time mm. in England, which I thought were bizarre as well. <laughs> I'm, 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 uh, that's all I've got. That's all I've got. It's it's a very confusing one, but it must be a frustrating one because if if things go well this week, they can uh, they can win their Champions League group, which would be remarkable. I mean th- that that would be that would be the most Lazio thing ever, wouldn't it? Like can't can't ever. beat Hellas away, but yeah, we can beat Atletico Madrid away <laughs> and win our Champions League group. It just it just makes no sense. Um, um, Monza Genoa, Dani Motta scores the only goal. Um, and speaking of great managers, Raffaele Palladino, mm. he seems destined mm. for greatness. Um, but our you know when he was appointed at Monza, Adriano Galliani mm. called him. Was it was lunch with you? <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a special up? memory, this one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So I, well, I, I live in Milan and I, yeah, I live very central in the city and I have done, been fortunate to do a lot, lot of work with a lot of the top former players and, yeah, very frequently find myself at lunch with a lot of these guys. And there was one particular lunch where I was uh, in in my area, very central, with a couple of the former players, Vieri and, and Matri and Boriello and, and Paladino was actually there at the time. And yes, did did receive a call, which then led to which then led to a basic uh, meeting just to finalise the formalities at the same place we had the we had the lunch, and then they closed that over they closed that over a dinner. A, Called the letter and the risotto alla milanese over a dinner, and then they they closed the deal, and that was that. So, yeah, it was there. It was my little slice of history with with Monza and Palazzino at this point. Brilliant. But hey, that's how that's how business is done in in Italy. So it was uh, good to be a part of the early stages of his journey there. Yeah, a friend of mine, Nicola Schira, he, he, he had a hashtag a few years back that he called Cena del Mercato, which is like <laughs> <laughs> where he used to basically go out for, for food and drinks. And, and, and yeah, but, but yeah, that's how it works in Milan. It really is like that. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, yeah, of course, that, that, I mean, Paladino is definitely someone who I think is someone interesting and I think he's doing a great job. And I love how he, you know, just to touch on that Italian angle, I love how he continues to play young players and young Italian players, and I love how For he's sure. developing them. Um, and and just to watch him, I mean, I'm a big fan of Lorenzo Colombo. I love Colpani. Yeah. I think Colpani is something special. And it's nice to see what he can do, because I think as an Italian mm. coach, the next generation of Italian coach, I think you're going to have to do work the, this way. You're going to have to improve yeah. the players you've got cause, because of the lack of funds. Um, where do you see yeah. Palladino going next? Well, I think that's really, uh, I'll just pick up on that last point. I think that's really important because even though Italy have been a country that haven't now consistently produced a whole heap of young talent, the young coaches are still coming through. Italy Mm. still remain very, very strong at developing coaches. And I certainly feel that the, the, the understanding of where the league is at in terms of the money, that they can't just spend the same amounts of money as other top clubs in top leagues are paying. So they're going to have to focus on what they've got, and that's developing the youth players. So it's it's an exciting time, and with that mindset, I think, well, where, where can he go next? Look, it, again, I really do feel that the, the summer ahead, there will be some significant change on the coaching front. And mm, me too. Look, re- really, really, outside of, outside of Inter – I, I think that almost every top job could at some point become available potentially. Yeah. There, there could there could be change everywhere. So, really anywhere. And I, I do feel that it's a I feel that it's a moment in time where we could see that next shift of of Italian managers really take the take the top stage and and really make their mark at the highest level. It could be the the beginning of of the next phase of Italian football with some of these names coming through. So. I don't really, I don't have any inside word, any indication as to what the future holds. Monza, Milan, there could be some links there, but I, that's just speculation. But look, mm. at this point, I'm just, I'm, I am really excited because I, I really believe that with the change in younger coach coming through, there will be an overall change in mentality. If there is that change in mentality and we do see Serie A start to really blood and believe in young talent, then that will benefit Italian football and the Italian national team overall. And that's, again, me in what I do, in what I'm passionate about, that's what I'm really keen to see. So Mm. I'm very hopeful that we see a lot of these young managers make it to the top level very soon. Absolutely. Um, just moving on to uh, Champions League preview of the, the last group stage uh, matches are played. On Tuesday, Inter hosts Sociedad de San Siro. And, and it's very simple. Inter have to win to top uh, to secure the group mm-hmm. win. Uh, anything else, Sociedad win. Um, and then, of course, as we said on Wednesday, Atletico Madrid against Lazio. Lazio have to win to win the group. And if they did, it would be it would be the most Lazio thing ever if they did. <laughs> um, and then only only to lose on the weekend because they play Inter on the weekend as well. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's 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 Lazio. You just you, they, they just confuse you. Um, <laughs> but then on the Tuesday, we got Napoli Braga and mm. Napoli need only one point. They can even afford to lose by one goal, but not by Correct. two. 
surely they can't blow this on Adriano. Come no, on. no, <laughs> surely. No, no, come on. No, no, no. Napoli have to. This is, look, if it's a draw, whatever they have to get, they have to do enough here. They're, I'm I'm very, very confident in this one. Obviously, what confidence is there to be gained from the last three performances? Mm. Obviously, defeat to Real, Madrid, Inter and Juve. But no, look, Napoli, with respect to Braga, this is a Braga team who recent fixtures, they have been on a good run, but they have played some of the, the teams in the bottom half of, of the Portuguese league and obviously uh, picked up a point against Union Berlin on the previous match day. Napoli must get the result here. This is uh, this is th- this will be a major major failure if uh, Napoli are to fault here. So I think we will see Napoli go through second. I mentioned the Inter earlier. I think Inter will look. If Inzaghi wasn't confident that they would beat Real Sociedad, I. Th- think that he would have taken the Benfica match a little more seriously. I think he's got full confidence that his players will will uh, take care of Real Sociedad on the final match day. So I'm very confident that we'll see Napoli obviously go through in second because Real Madrid have gone far from five. So it's already won the group and Inter will, will win the group. Lazio have a guess what will happen because anything could happen. But <laughs> I, I, think in, I think in the end, Atleti, Atleti will be a little too strong at home and and obviously the other one well as well is uh, Milan yeah, that's Newcastle, going to be uh, I mean th- this, th- 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 this, oh. this is the situation Milan have to win and they have to hope mm. that Dortmund beat PSG to go through I, I think it's a <sighs> snowball's chance in hell here no well look I was very, again, from an Italian perspective, very, very disappointed when Kylian Mbappe scored that 98th minute mm. uh, equaliser against Newcastle because what happened on match day five, if Newcastle had won that match, then basically Milan could have won this game and hope for a Dortmund win or draw. Mm. Now they need Dortmund to win and obviously need to beat Newcastle. Look, I've covered many of the matches in this group this season and PSG on the road, obviously they're two defeats from two matches. They lost 2-1 at Milan, they lost 4-1 at Newcastle and PSG have been nowhere near the best version of PSG that we've seen uh, this season. And I think going to Dortmund where Dortmund need a point to win the group, I think Dortmund can definitely win this match. They they had a very hard-fought win at the weekend uh, they played in the in the Bundesliga against Leipzig. Oh, sorry, it was a half or defeat rather, two three at home to Leipzig. So it was a tough one there, but it was a Dortmund team that we know always at home are always very tough to beat, particularly in this competition. So I don't think that is. Imp- I, I think that is very possible. I think Dortmund could beat PSG. The Milan trip to Newcastle, really anything could happen. But Newcastle are without so many players. Yeah. That's really they they got beaten heavily in the Premier League at the weekend. It's uh it's really it's a it's a team that aren't in their in their best shape for for obvious reason. Who knows? Who knows? Stranger things have happened. We remember Atalanta's incredible yeah. qualification when they lost their first few <laughs> games. Milan obviously haven't been at their best, but they have been solid without being brilliant in this competition. Who knows? I'm not writing Milan off just yet. I think there's a small hope that if uh, if Milan can can get the job done, obviously if they do win, they'll play Europa League at the very least. Do Milan fans want to play Europa League? I'm not sure, but mm. we'll see what happens. It will be an exciting finish in any case. Mm, for sure, for sure. All right, uh, let's move on to Baggio and Prem Face and Serie A's of the week. Right, Baggio, I've got a couple. I've got Muriel, of course. Uh, the back heel, mm-hmm. um, Zaccagni back heel for Lazio against Hellas, but also Matteo Brunori for Palermo, Serie B uh, mm. against Parma, that 40 yarder. Did you see that? Amazing. What a finish. It's so, so good. Really beautiful. Uh, so we we had some amazing goals this weekend in Italy. Do you, do you have any ones of your own that you want to? Look, Muriel. We we used every adjective in the book for Muriel. That was that was a moment. Look, I think I think the moment for me. Uh, it's just it's it's a beautiful story that we touched on earlier. But it's not the most beautiful goal of the weekend. But Gatti's moment again to do mm. what he's done. It's just it's it's really nice to see. Uh, a player who's who's worked very hard and you know has come under a lot of scrutiny in his time and had some difficult moments this season. Just really special to see him uh, step up and have another special memory like that. So look, it's, it was a really great weekend. A lot of a lot of action, a lot of entertainment. But oh yeah, I'll, I'll 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 put Gatti forward for that. And of course, prem face of the week. There's quite a few. Of uh, for me, <laughs> I, I I don't I don't I, I can't even. How do you not know how to do maths? 
Like, I mean, we're talking <laughs> like 38 divided by two is not 16. Like, <laughs> like, how do you not know that? At an, like, if you're over eight, it's, it's just, and I'm referring to CBS Golazzo tweet who said, now we're at the halfway point in the Premier League and it's mm. 16 games in. And I'm thinking, come on. <laughs> guys <laughs> yeah do do better than that use a calculator at the very least <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh my god and it was on no yes yeah, it was it was a Nobel prize day as well it just made everything perfect and it? it's like <laughs> anyway <laughs> but did you have a prem face of the week well, i know you have a prem face of the week <laughs> uh, look it, I, I sometimes sometimes i i, I don't know what what week <laughs> Certain things happen because they 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 seem so they seem so frequent at times, don't they? Look, there was the one there was the one. Uh, I see. I don't even know what day it was, but it was the it was the conversation in, in the ESPN FC panel Podcast. that discussed yeah. Yeah. Arsenal beating Inter in a hypothetical match that hasn't happened and and <laughs> won't happen for now if they both win their group. And it wasn't it wasn't the fact that there were some who believed. That Arsenal would beat Inter. That that's completely fine. fine. You can you can de- you can debate whatever you wish. But there was a, a one of my one of my favourite friends in the industry, Don Hutchison, who was on the on yeah. the panel, and he he commentates Italian football. Obviously, loves his English football as well, but very passionate in Italian football. We worked together for a couple of the broadcasts I worked for, and he was just very much defending Inter, saying you know they played a Champions League final a few months ago, like. I think Inter would be amongst the top favourites. And and it wasn't the fact that, again, that they disagreed, but it was the fact that they actually laughed at him like it was so yeah. unbelievable that he was suggesting that Inter would be favoured ahead of Arsenal that – I think that takes out my prem face of, of the of the week, if not the month, if not the year, because it's like, <laughs> you know, how dare you suggest that your team that was in a Champions League final only months ago would beat our team, which makes no sense because Arsenal have been nowhere near a Champions League match, let alone a final in many <laughs> years. And all of a sudden in a in a in a group again with respect, but in a group that is is nothing different to a Europa League group, they're going to win the group and all of a sudden that means they're amongst the top favourites for the Champions League just because they play Premier League, it makes no sense whatsoever. So I can't I haven't shaken that thought out of my mind and I'd love the prospect of seeing Inter and Arsenal meet in a quarter final at some point and well, putting that debate to bed, but <laughs> let's see what happens in the, in the mean, coming months. Th- the funny thing about that is that that went on Twitter and then all of a sudden this, this spark, <laughs> this weird rivalry between Inter and Arsenal fans arguing this is exactly like last year when Inter and Barcelona <laughs> fans were going at each other, but at least they were in the same group. <laughs> That's this right. is just weird. And and it's, it's real just, weird. It's it's been such a weird reaction by Arsenal fans going things like, "Oh, we beat you five one ten twenty <laughs> years ago," and it's like, "Yeah, you your best ever Ar- Arsenal team beat one of the most mediocre inter sides with Hector Coop. I mean, when he was sacked, and exactly, and and it's just like, and it's like they haven't even won the Premier League yet, and 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 it's gone so. I call it North London syndrome. This is something yeah. that is, there's something in the water and air in North London that <laughs> evidently with Tottenham and, and Arsenal, they, 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 they're the best team in the world after they win a couple mm. of games. I mean, you saw it with, uh, uh, with, with uh, Tottenham in the beginning of the season. And I like Ange. I think he's a lovely man. Mm. I genuinely think he's a lovely man. And I wish him nothing but the best. Mm. But the fact that they were hyping them up for him to win the Premier League after just winning four or five games in a row... And then now they've lost five for five games in a row. And then mm. they want to. It's just this this hubris is on steroids. Obviously, Spurs is way worse than Arsenal. But now, but because at least Arsenal have won something, you know, this side of the millennium. Mm. But, sure, sure. But so, but it's just, it's so weird. I mean, you know, when Inter and Milan were, were off for a decade, pretty much, in their banter era, as soon as, you know, you didn't see the fan bases think that they were, you know, Champions League winners and I don't know what this, that mm. and the other and start saying, oh, you know, our our third choice right back would start for your team, <laughs> nonsense like that. And it's just, it just feels so bizarre, the whole thing. It does. I, I, I don't, look, I, I may be wrong. I'm sure there are, I'm not even talking fan bases, just clubs and whatever in general, but I'm sure there are some that are perhaps the same level of, you know, <laughs> live in the past. But I, I don't know too many clubs that come to mind that, that, that do that's well certainly not in in Serie A. I can't think of a you're right Inter and Milan in the lower points over over the last decade or so they weren't 
clinging on to the past to compare themselves to other European top clubs, thinking, yeah, but we won the Champions League X amount of years ago and we've won this and we've done that. It's it's just bizarre. But again, my, my take from the particular reaction to, to the suggestion that Inter could challenge, mm. it was as if that it was being suggested that Salernitana could challenge or a lower level Italian club could. Ch- it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a wild statement. We're talking about mm. the best team in Italy who very close to winning the title, who very close to winning the Champions League, just doing what they did last season, but being a little better. So it was a, it was a bizarre reaction. And yeah, I look, it, it's not surprising though. It's just been no. the case and what we've become no. very used to as Italian football fans. Mm, yeah. And then finally, um, Serie A of the week. This has got to be, I mean, this is the only second or third time we're doing it, but yeah. I think this is the greatest Serie A of the week <laughs> ever. Ever. How on <laughs> earth do you do this? So in the in the week they have this thing, in this last week they have the Oscar del Calcio, right? And it's they they have like an awards show for the for the last season of 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 Serie A players and you know best striker, best blah blah blah, you know all the usual stuff, right? How do you manage to misspell the winner <laughs> of a of a player who's won an award on the award? <laughs> well, you have to be Italian, don't you? It's uh, <laughs> uh, and and, and, and I sure. looked at it, and I was looking at it because it was Chicha Kvaratskhelia, and it's they've romanized his name for some inexplicable reason. So it was K apostrophe, but then it was misspelled because it said Kvarats, it said Varatskhela. <laughs> I, I I I just couldn't stop laughing. Yeah, look, look, we know we know that the we know Sadia's strong point isn't any in any language but their own. So it's uh, it immediately becomes a tough tough exercise when we when we start to go down that path. But it's uh, that's very bizarre, isn't it? It's very very weird. <laughs> I, I, I'm just I'm like I just I looked at that and I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> um, have you got one as well? Or look along along that path, I, I think it's. Again, working in the mode that I do, I cover Italian football for for almost all the the English speaking TV broadcasters around the world, and I I'm very used to the lack of of English coverage that that we see across the globe. Look, it's probably not one that's just alone to this week, but I guess it's in the case of uh, a recent experience I had. Uh, well, I was uh, there was an event in in uh, Rome that covered basically all, all sport across Italy and whatnot. And it was a conference with some of the top people in Serie A speaking at. And there was some talk about the new Radio Serie A, which is obviously a, a radio platform that has been launched, some really important figures involved in the game, doing some great stuff domestically. The question was put to them by a, by a good friend of mine in the industry at this summit in Rome with regards to, well, you know, you've done very well. You're getting some good guests it's servicing the Italian market. And would the the question was put to them? Well, you know, are you, you going to do this surely for the you know the rest of the world? Maybe speak English or or other languages. And no word of a lie that the the question that was asked was scoffed at and laughed at by the Italians, thinking that it was completely unnecessary to to service the other 7.9 billion people in the world. So it's just falls in line with everything that we have uh, discussed before, discussed today, and we'll discuss again with regards to just that lack of, I guess, uh, marketing awareness by the league to grow and expand. And and that's when we see issues like awards with misspelt names and <laughs> and a lack of and, – and using Google Translate to post tweets online. And it's just – well, that's because they – they have no interest in doing anything outside of their four walls. So it's uh, it's very annoying, but it's uh, it's quite funny that yeah, those in charge are like, well, no, there's no probably no point in doing anything in English going forward. So it's all the more important why yourself and Carla are doing great work here. This is having as big an impact as anything the league is doing. So always keep up the great work because it's uh, I think it holds a very important place in the game. Thank you so much, Edwin. I really appreciate that, and that segues Pleasure. nicely into into we've reached the end of the part of the, the episode. Um, we'll be back on Tuesday for a Q and A episode, and of course, the Thursday we'll be reviewing the Champions League games. But Adrian, thank you so much for stepping in and, and, and covering for Carlo and guest hosting. It's been an absolute pleasure. I know you travel and got so much going on. So I was going to let, 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 let the floor to you, to, you know, give you the floor and say, what have you got coming up? Where are you going next? And where can people follow you on social media? Absolute pleasure, Nima. Any time, and as I said, keep up the great work, both you. Love what you do. I've uh, I've got a 
a nice short stay in in Australia to spend some time with family over the over the break, which is always very nice. I do a little bit of tennis work as well, so I'll be covering the Australian Open mm. in uh, my home city of Melbourne. And then yeah, back into it for Serie A and Champions League in the new year after that, and obviously really busy first half of the year next year with the. Uh, my usual commitments around the Champions League and Serie A and then the Euros, which are going to be really, really exciting. And hopefully Italy can replicate what they did a few years ago. So very busy, always on the road. And just uh, yeah, every couple of days brings a, a new challenge ahead. So look, plenty of football, plenty of feature stories to come. And then obviously a lot of content in the lead up to the Euros. And then covering the Euros itself will be a very busy start to, to the first half of, of next year. And yeah, in terms of following me, anywhere anywhere you can but most active for, for my football work across twitter and instagram at adrian del monte there so hit me up there and yeah plenty more to come in the new year for sure well thank you very much for joining us and like i said everyone else thank you man. um we'll we'll be back on tuesday for the q a pod um and with a uh, caller we'll be back then and we'll also do uh, a, a thursdays as always a midweek review show but until next uh, but until then take care of yourselves and each other ciao ciao